Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m. Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. In this episode, we're visiting with the iconic Bob Dylan and his foray into a more countrified sound with the classic Nashville skyline. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. My name is Dean, here with Eric, and you're going to get weekly doses of music and movie goodness. We're... we're mining the the depths of our brains for for all this knowledge and presenting it to you right eric that's right digging digging deep <laughs> digging deep it's, it's sometimes the older we get it's a little bit more difficult i think <laughs> my 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 brain is someone is like an attic full of papers and you know when you're like wading yep. through and all the yep. and, and it's like you're up to your knees in newspaper that that's the way my my brain is my brain is organized that's what Ab- it's like absolutely so fi- cop- finding information is not as easy as it used to be no nope. It's not. And, you know, we tend to forget things and we're, you know, yeah. We, but this the stuff we don't forget no, no. this, you know, I forgot, I forgot if I went out for dinner last week on a certain day, but <laughs> I remember like about Bob Dylan and all this other stuff. So it's that, kind of funny. Yeah, so that... we, we thank you for joining us on, on this music and movie journey of the 3324 podcast. You can find us on social media. You found us here. So if you could do us a favor, and just go ahead and subscribe or follow depending on the app or what service you're using. But this way you always get notified of the new stuff. You know, we've got hour and long and change episodes every Thursday. And then on Mondays, we have a little short tidbit bite called a quick hit, which will tide you over till the big stuff. So uh, go ahead and do that. Follow us, subscribe us, share it, spread the, help us spread the word. That we, That's the great thing, right? And we thank you. And we always. thank you. And we appreciate what was it. it? Uh, my mother thanks you. My father, father thanks, thanks you. you. My sister thanks, thanks you. you. And I thank you. What what <laughs> movie? What movie? Um, oh my God. What See? movie? See, there it is. I, Black I, and white. Uh, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Right. <laughs> Yankee Doodle Do or Die. There it is. See? Cagney. Yeah. Yankee yeah, Doodle Dandy. Great. Great film, great film. <laughs> but boy, am I losing my touch. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? We we should have done we for Fourth of July. We did Jaws. We might have had that's should have considered right. maybe Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, right? no, Jaws was. I mean, Jaws I, was yeah, great. I what usually watch know? it on Memorial Day. Actually, you know, what Yankee Doodle you, Dandy? No, or Jaws, uh, Jaws. Oh. kicks off the summer for me. You yeah. know, but uh, yeah, but even though it's kind of set on the Fourth of July, but. No, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll yeah. do it someday. You know, yeah. why not? I don't know if we. I mean, if we are only going to do one, if we're going to film, it's not going to be that one. I it's got to be. One. Yeah, it's got to be one of his. Yeah, it's got to be like Angels something. with Dirty Faces or one of those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah not his. Music. I'm, although he's a great dancer and a great and uh, you know known for his dancing prowess. But anyway, let's move forward in time to the album that we're talking about by Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. And it's Nashville Skyline. So let's do the stats and then we'll kind of talk about why this album and why not the other one or whatever it is. Or, <laughs> sure. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that. So this was released in April of 1969, produced by Bob Johnston. Hit number three on those Billboard charts that we so love to look at. Mm-hmm. All the songs, not surprisingly, were written by Bob Dylan. Certified platinum, which means one million copies. Back then, that was probably a big, a big seller. Yeah. Uh, in today's day and age of, of blockbuster album releases, not much, but uh, certainly no, no slouch. That's right. Um, three, three singles from the record. Uh, I threw it all away. Lay, lady, lay, and tonight I'll be staying here with you. 
which Lay Lady Lay, I think, is the got the most airplay. I think that's the most successful yep. of, of the three. Yeah, certainly. at the time, that's the only one I ever knew yeah, from this album. That, that's well. right. <laughs> I didn't even know it was Bob Dylan back then. Yeah, because it's just his voice is so different. But anyway, yeah, we'll, get to well that. that's that's the thing, you know, and, and I think that's what we're going to be spending pro- probably a decent time talking about is the t- Dylan's time around the recording of this album, because this mm-hmm. album is kind of short. Yeah, really short. But there's a lot of things that were going on before this album came out that really kind of lead to Nashville Skyline and, and lead to mm-hmm. uh, him kind of changing. Because in the you know his first album was in 1962, and and through most of the 60s, folk artist, right? I mean, he was the yeah. social and political voice of a of a generation at the time. Um, you know, was, picking almost... up with Peter Paul and Mary and Pete Seeger and all those folk artists that that people were loving, uh, Dylan just slid right in there with the social commentary songs and he political. He slid songs. right in there, but he also he 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 rose above all those other people and almost became a prophet <laughs> in, in, in a sense to, you know, to a lot of people held them to such high regard um, yeah. with, th- with that kind of thing that when he did start to make some changes, it, uh, it ruffled some feathers. Yeah. yeah <laughs> if, that like, was the know, thing so, is, is, yeah, he was yeah. firmly entrenched in, in the, in the folk scene. Yep. And, and, the, and those artists and, and kind of took him under his wing and, and that's really what he was, uh, you know, his, his, yeah, his, his lyrics are very thoughtful very poetic, very passionate, sometimes very social, sometimes political. And, uh, and he had become known for that. He had be, you know, and I don't think that dude, if you look at, if you ever look at interviews back then, he's not a serious person. No. Yeah. He's you know, always so, kinda, so he's I think kind of sarcastic. That, he's always joking. He's always smiling. He's like, I, he's, you know, he, you know what I wrote down in my self seriously. You, you know, know what I wrote down right. in my notes? Yeah. I wrote down that he's an expert troll. Cause I think he knows it. like, he, he tr- I think that's what he, uh, he does. Like he is an expert troll, meaning he, he subverts what the expectations are for people. Oh, and yeah, absolutely. And I think that's yeah. what, when people were taking him so seriously, I don't think he was able to take that seriously. Right. That yeah. people were putting all that on him. Like, Oh, you, you say right. this and you do that. And, and they were ex- expecting that he was this outside of his performances, that he was that person. Mm-hmm. And he, he kind of really wasn't, you know, he kind of really liked to, to subvert the expectations and make fun of himself. And that's not to uh, say that not what take he, it too seriously. Right. What, what he was writing and singing about wasn't important to him. Yeah. Of course. But on the other hand, it's like, how far do you go? I mean, you know, let's, I mean, he, he considered, I'm just a songwriter people. I mean, I, I, you know, you have to change at one at some point or another. And P, I remember just like, if you ever watch the, the, the DA Benny, uh, Benny maker documentary, don't look, don't look back. Don't look back that's the tour like when he was touring england at the time and he was plugging in yeah and he's using a like a, a band and they plugged and people were yeah. just booing him and, and of course well, that well, was yeah that, i, I have that written down which which yeah. was a, a you know it's it's legendary now mm-hmm. it's mythical mm-hmm. but it, w- what really kicked that off before the european tour was uh july 25th 1965 yeah. At the Newport Folk Festival, right? That's the right. Newport Folk Festival. So yeah. it's folk artists. <laughs> yeah. So Dylan Dylan gets up and he plays a few songs with an acoustic guitar and then and then plugs in. And it was known as Dylan Goes Electric. Yeah. And you know, there's varying reports, but but overwhelmingly the myth or the legend is that half the crowd was booing. Because yeah. this was a betrayal of the artistry and the social commentary and all this and the, and the stylings of folk music that all of a sudden Dylan was basically like thumbing his nose at, especially at the Newport folk festival. When you plug in, I don't know, man, you put yourself in that position where you're putting people on a pedestal like that, that, you know, you're going to get burned at some point. You're going to, yeah, you're going to, so. the expectation is too great. You, there's, it's inevitable. You know, they're always going to, and, and, and the pressure of, of, of having to deal with it, but he, <laughs> He kind of does it in such a way that, you know, like you're right. He is, he's definitely, he just turns the tables and he just doesn't care. There's like, yeah, he never bought seemed, into it. That's the it, thing is he never right, got this, the feedback and then started thinking that he was this, this thing. That's yeah. right. And it's just like, and it, people say it's like, oh, total disregard for the audience. And, yeah. you know, and over the years, yeah, we, we will talk about total disregard for the and, audience oh, later on when will. we talk we about our Dylan. <laughs> 
our, 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 our first one and only experience. Our own, one and only Dylan show. We will talk about disregard for the audience when we get there. And it's, we will we will get to there. I think we'll save it for the very end. Yep. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. But but yeah, but but so so Dylan was was in an evolutionary stage. He had done all these kind of protest songs and, and had been known as this thing. Yeah. And then there's a couple of things that started happening. So yeah, he plugs in, he goes electric. That's met with with varying degrees. Some people were like, yeah. And most people were like, nah, you know, that's not what we're expecting out of Bob Dylan. Yeah. He continues that, right? Then he mm-hmm. partners up with with uh, Ronnie Hawkins' band, known as the Hawks, who would become the band, the band. who would n- later become the band. And that was his backing band. So he was taking that whole uh, electric thing out on the road and really kind of committing to it and continuing with it and experimenting with it. And that was, you know, kind of where where he was going after blonde on blonde, basically. Yeah. I think, you know, as far as, you know, lyrically, he's, he is a savant. I mean, he's, he's one of the literary giants of our, of, 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 of generations. Um, but I think he was wanting to embrace the music as well. I mean, he was very passionate about, you know, where the stuff came from, what, you know, what type of music, very old, like he really loved the old, like, you know, blues, you know, he's always kind of delving into this, like the roots of, of, of everything. And he, I think he had a, a really big uh, head for that, like in, ten, in terms of like wanting to, to embrace that style and the changes that he was making musically and not just poetically and, and lyrically. I mean, yeah. we talk about lyrics all the time, not being as important, you know, we, we need to have something that, that gives us a hook and certainly my first experience with Dylan was not blonde on blonde or any of his early stuff. It was his later stuff. And, and mm-hmm. certainly one of this album in particular and, and time out of mind, which came out in 97, which is, you know, what, one of my favorite records. And so late in his career too, it was like his, that, that second stage of his career. Yeah. He's but, had men, he's a, that might not have even been the second stage. <laughs> that well, could have been up well, to the, yeah, could've that could have been like the yeah. four. I mean, he has, he, he is a chameleon. You know, and yeah. he keeps evolving and changing, whether it's painting, whether it's acting, you know, his musical endeavors. Uh, he has got, you know, a brand of whiskey out. So he does, you know, he does, he will not be like pegged into one thing. He is, he is not that. And and back in the mid 60s, when when he did go electric, he around that time, he also had a, a motorcycle accident. Yeah. And that forced him, you know, he was kind of out of the spotlight for quite some time while he recovered doing a lot of that recovery in upstate New York and Woodstock. That's when, when John Wesley Harding came out, which was the album before this, which was kind of sparse and started those, those, uh, the leanings of, of what we would see on Nashville skyline. And he was also, he also did famously what was known as the basement tapes with the band. With the band. And that was just them in Woodstock, literally in the basement of the house and big pink in, in Saugerties or wherever it was. And just running the, running the tape machine. Yeah. And recording it's, just what came out, whatever, whatever it was, whatever. It and was. those tapes, yep. they, they did that and then didn't do anything with them till like 1975. So those sat for ages. And even then it wasn't, it wasn't the complete, which everybody was craving and salivating. They wanted more and more because you know, what the, what they did get wasn't enough. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. It was so heavily later bootlegged. Later, Dylan later heavily on. Bootlegged they, they cause he's very prolific. Justice. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, but again, it's like embracing that that those musical changes. I know I know often he would be very disillusioned with the music business in general at large. Just uh, just sort of uh, why do I do this? You know, what's the point? Kind mm-hmm. of thing. He gets into those moods where he's just like and yeah, then a little he, bit of contempt, and that's when he makes those goes away for a while and makes those little changes and comes back pisses some people off some people love it (laughs) it's it's he there's such a wide range of of uh of of fandom now i mean he's cultivated such a such an eclectic yeah because he's had so many different periods in in his career that if if you're not into the folk thing Mm -hmm. you don't have to be there's so many other eras to choose from the set his 70s stuff was was very different like i said the 80s and then he embraced actually becoming part of a band when he joined the traveling Wilburys, <laughs> two yeah. albums there. Um, and then, yeah, that, that kind of gave him some momentum to, to push into the nineties and he's still going. So mm-hmm. when we catch up with him for Nashville skyline, 
the thing that drew that really drew me to this album because it's my it's my favorite Dylan album. Okay. Um, and I came to Dylan late in life. I was never a me big too. fan, only because of the you know the imitations, you know, mm. with, with his <laughs> type of singing. You know, like it's kind of like yeah, you know, not not really my cup of tea. But but Lay Lady Lay is probably like my favorite Dylan song. Absolutely. Yeah. Like there's just something about it that's kind of haunting and and romantic. So it was always a favorite of mine. And I never had any Dylan albums. And then, I, like, I don't know how long. It was a while ago that this CD came out called Dylan. And it was just, like, all the greatest hits. It was, like, everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know what? I, I You know, and and when you listen to his early stuff and then you listen to Lay, Lady, Lay, and here's the, the demarcation point, too, is on Nashville Skyline, he started singing different. He actually started crooning. They call it crooning or country crooning or singing. Yeah. yeah. And it was a different style than that other kind of, uh, vocal stylings that he had during his folk stuff. This was this was singing what, what he was actually doing. Yeah, um, and I song, like that. I like yeah. his voice. Right. The, so the way the songs were written, uh, it, it you know it required a singing voice. Whereas you know there's a cadence to his you know to the, the yeah more, to his other stuff. It was the more the, the lengthy poetic that the songs that just you know the anthems that just go on and on and on the yeah. verses and it's because it, it's it's prose it's actual prose and the way it's people make such a just people who analyze the hell out of the way he writes and yep. they, they compare to like the great writers of, of the past and that kind of thing so yeah this album totally reflected he wanted to do something light something yeah. just it, it wasn't political at all which of course again, no and there was a lot going on when this was recorded a- exactly a lot you of had ter- assassinations you had uh, civil <laughs> yeah. rights you had protests you had a lot of stuff that was that was really ripe yeah for social commentary and for someone to be making songs about it and who better than dylan to turn who better than dylan to turn his back on that <laughs> right? right like who better and, than dylan to say i'm um you know that's not where i'm at and that's not the direction i'm yeah, going in I, so i, I want to do something do i want to do something for me i want to do something you know he's just exploring like. exploring what he wanted to do and, and and going country yeah i mean and again ruffled some feathers people were you know i'm actually surprised that this album did as well as it did I, I kind of assumed that it was not in everybody's like top 10 Bob Dylan mm-hmm. albums. I've known a couple of few people that are quote unquote true Bob Dylan fans that are, you know, when I, when I mentioned that I liked this album or Lay Lady Lay, they looked at me yeah. like I had three heads. What are you kidding? I, I, and some guy, one, one, per, one person in particular uh, made the comment, I, you don't know Bob Dylan very well, do you? And I'm like, well, I guess I don't. You know, and um, I'm, when well, I look to you, that's what I'm saying. Like when I look back on it now, I'm thinking you don't know Bob Dylan very well. Yeah. You know, yeah, we'll, it's it's, it's know. horses for courses, right? That's the exactly. thing is, is he's been recording since 1962, and and so what? We're in 2021, so you're talking almost 60 years, and ver- a very prolific 60 years. So let let's say that too. Yes, he doesn't. You know, he really cranks the cranks out the out either the albums. Uh, the special editions, the bootleg series, mm. you know, greatest hits. I mean, there's a lot there. One funny thing about Nashville Skyline is is when he was at the time questioned about why why does your voice sound different? Um, he had claimed it was it was because he stopped smoking. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> but that doesn't change your voice like that. He was singing. He was. It's not like he sang that way before, and well, all of a sudden it sounds different. That, that I think that was him trolling again. It's like, well, I, I stopped smoking. <laughs> It's like no, well, you're singing. I mean, you're singing a different way, intentionally. Yeah, well, he's actually you know? trying to. You know, he's actually attempting to sing. I will. Yeah. Let's, let's put it there. Well, yeah. You know, and, and which I lo- again, I love it because it's yeah. not perfect, and it's it is, and it is his his singing voice is a little strange sounding. Mm-hmm. But I think that's what I like about it too, because it it makes it a little more vulnerable. Because he is doing something. That's outside yeah. of what he had done. This came out in what sixty nine. So this is outside of something he had really done for the past six or seven years. Yeah. As far yeah. as as far as that, no one really changes their vocal style. No, it's, it's right unless something yeah. happens, unless they get old and they and they they do that. But not someone who's in the in really in the early stages of his career in sixty nine does not change the way he you sing. That's right. I, I the only like, other that person sounds could- so different. The only person I could uh, maybe I could compare him to would be somebody like David Bowie, who makes you know he, again a chameleon who's gone through so many changes in his life. But uh, but yeah, in this album, and he would, I think it actually sounds good though. I mean, I, you know, yeah. it's the, I think it's the best he's ever sounded personally. <laughs> 
But I mean, I, you I know, like it. And, and, you know, he's smiling on on the album cover. So this is yeah. like, a, you know, for me, it's a, it's like it was a, it was one of those ones visually that that kind of struck me. Also, just when you're looking at the album art. It's kind of like he's tipping his hat to the camera and smiling and holding yeah. his guitar. And you don't, and I looked, I went and looked at other Bob Dylan album covers. And like, this is the only one that he's actually smiling on. Like he's on the, a lot of, <laughs> most of the covers is co- not that he's grimacing in other ones, but he's just like serious or, yeah. you know, flat faced. Right. This is the only one that he's like smiling in, you know, this one which, looks, which is kind of a thing. I think that kind of, he was happy, you know, happy doing this. And it, was, and, it, it, look, it looks like a candid photo. It doesn't look like it was like he was yeah. posing. He's just looking down and it's like a quick, like somebody took a yeah, quick. Yeah, someone taking from you know, up, you know? up, yeah, from looking exactly. up. And it's just, yeah. I, I love it. I love yeah. the album cover too. So, yeah. so it's just, it, it, you know, and this is an easy listen too. So if you're not, oh, yeah. so listen, if you're not into Bob Dylan, like I wasn't, um, I think this is a good entree into it because it's not the heavy. If you don't want the political, the social, or mm-hmm. or that kind of stuff, I would say go in go in with Nashville Skyline because mm-hmm. then you can go in either direction. Because this was the last album of, of the '60s, so then you start the '70s with Blood on the Tracks and and all that kind of great stuff. Mm-hmm. Or if you want to revisit the earlier stuff and see what all that was about, the folk, the more folk stylings, this this puts you kind of right in the middle of maybe like his first and second phases of his career, perhaps mm-hmm. I, yeah. I would say mm-hmm. this, this might be the beginning of like phase two of his career. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and he would certainly revisit it in much, much later in life and stuff in the, in the late nineties. And even now in the two thousands, he's coming, going back to this sort of rootsy like country style. And it's, this is original stuff, by the way, this isn't, yeah. um, we're not talking about all the cover albums that he's done which, you know, some blues and, 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 you know, uh, folk and country and, you know, uh, but really digging deep into like the, the heart of the, like the true, like Appalachian kind of stuff. Like I know he's done some albums like that, or at least tried to. Um, but here again, it's like, I can't, you know, we can't over. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's snappy. It's, it's country. It's, it's, it's just it's kind of rollick. It's, it's, you know what? This album should have been named Freewheel and not his second, his second album I should agree. have been named no. Freewheel. And this one should have, cause that's the way it is. This is like a freewheeling album. It's just, it, it really it is. It's moving. It's breezy. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, the it's, songs it's, are quick. They, you know, they're, they're basically all, all of them are love songs and, and they're just kind of really like, like, uh, yeah, it, it kind of you kind of get in and get out with this album, and it opens though with with one of the greatest songs, which is you know "Girl from the North Country." Yep, which he wrote back in '62, but actually didn't get around to it until until '69, and it's got Johnny Cash on it mm-hmm. singing with him. And you could tell that th- I think this this song I think is going to be indicative of the album because if you listen to them duetting, they're not duetting perfectly. They're actually not really too in sync with each other. No. Which is means it's got that raw feeling to it. It got the, it's got the feeling of we're just going to, we're going to knock this out mm-hmm. and we're going to kind of get it done, roll the tape, let's sing it. And that's how it sounds. It sounds like this was a performance and this is how it came out. They didn't go back and, you know, cause they're out of sync with their, with their vocalizations sometimes. And that's great. I love it though. Mm-hmm. It's not, it it's makes a, it, it's more genuine. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that kind of stuff, well, we, you know, they they didn't spend a whole lot of time like you know harmonizing and you know you yeah. notice like these like people back in the day singing over one another and that you know kind of thing and just it just the joy of getting of of just singing the song together, but not having to like sing in a different key to harmonize is is, is great. You yeah, just, they you, just sang together. You're just singing together, right? I mean, it's like it's like you and I just like started singing a song and we would well, just be, it, it might be know, close to that. <laughs> Well, I'm not it saying might it, sound, it might sound like that. <laughs> I wouldn't say it'd be good, but it would, but you know what I mean? It's on, spirit, on our first day. It might, the, the, the spirit of it though, is just enjoying it's, yeah, it's, it's the passion to do it. It's, it's yeah. let's just do it. That's let's right. Let's just record it. And, and this song was used to great effect in silver linings playbook. Yeah. She played yep. when, when Jennifer Lawrence played this for Bradley Cooper's character, when it was just, when, when she, she needed a dance partner and he agreed to do it. And it's like their first meeting for like the dance lessons. And she plays this and says, you know, just, just sit down and just listen, just listen to this song. Well, I think Used like, to such great effect. I think you like that movie. <laughs> no, I actually, I don't like Silver Linings Playbook. Are you serious? I love it. Of course you yeah. You I love Silver Linings you know, Playbook. I do too. I mean, you bring it up a lot though. So I think, I well, think we, we might I'll, be I'll doing stop. that. No, 
<laughs> well, we'll have to do it. Oh we'll yeah, have... we're definitely going to do it. Of we're course. definitely going to do it. Okay, so yeah, so, you. Uh, but and you know what it is though. We keep talking about albums that use that 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 uh, songs appear on from Silver Linings Playbook, right? Led Zeppelin. What what is yeah. it should never be. So it's mm-hmm. just got a great soundtrack as well. But yeah, that's what this and, podcast is all about, right? And we, we 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 make that transition from yeah. music to movies, and we, that's what we, we move, love anyway. We move uh, silently, like a I think some of the, some of our favorite films is because they use these songs in them. <laughs> well, sometimes, a, well, you know, honestly, sometimes you get introduced to it. That's right, especially that's right. in Silver Linings Playbook, because some of the some of the choices are are like that. That this would be an obscure choice to put in a movie. Yeah. Very, you know, I, I, if you're going to go with Dylan songs or, or whatever, like this would be a very obscure choice, but it fit like it fit with with what was going on. So it's like, wow. Oh, wow. This is really cool. Uh, let me go check it out. And then you and then you go back. So it's not just always, music, but yeah. But well, it's, always, it, 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 it's it part too. of the script. Right. I mean, you, you're a director. Uh, you want the right kind of song for for the for the scene, you know, so the the the, the deeper the well, I, I the better. You know, I, I always I always enjoyed hearing those like obscure songs like, oh, man, you know, like, you know, where they get that from. And it's, it's so cool. It just makes the movie that much better. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it, it's so. just yeah, it's just and this is this is one of them. And it, and it opens it really opens the album. And, and believe it or not, once you get through once you get through that song, that's the mm-hmm. longest song on the album. Mm-hmm. This song, this album is short and sweet. Yeah. Uh, but I mean it in, in both in in both terms. It is short and it is a sweet album because it's just it, it's infinitely listenable. The 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 band that he assembled just they just kind of move through these songs. And there was a, a, a bass guitar player and a guitar player on this album uh, who I believe got hired kind of at the last minute for these sessions because he was available or someone dropped out if I'm not sure mistaken. But uh, his name was Charlie Daniels. Yeah, that's right. And this is the Charlie Daniels that did go down to Georgia and, the, and went battle with Georgia, the devil. Yeah. That's right. For a golden <laughs> fiddle. That that is the same Charlie Daniels. So yeah, so he was uh Dylan was was there in in with these country artists and, and country session musicians and, and getting it done. To be alone with you. Again, quick songs, but you know, I threw it all away. I love I threw it all away. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. It's just, and, you know, probably my second favorite on the record be behind lady lay of course yeah and i threw um, it all away was like you said it, it was the first single which yeah. is which is interesting but these are just like little kind of musings about relationships or about being in yeah. love um and that's what i like about them is, is they're kind of nuggets they're like little nuggets right they're, which wouldn't be in dylan's wheelhouse right he's always you yeah. know po- po- political you know, and he's writing about relationships. That's that's something new, and I, you would think that people would embrace that more. You know, being that it's like you know, there are certain people out there that don't really care about the politics as much. And maybe yeah. at the time, maybe we can't really speak to that time, of course. But you know, we were so young. But um, you know, <laughs> we were just we were just we were babies. We were so young. <laughs> we were babies. We'll put it out there. We weren't we like were, teenagers, we like were, building it, rockets in the we backyard. Were, no, we uh, but uh, <laughs> you would think that a more general audience would have embraced Dylan's, mm-hmm. you know, this kind of stuff more. And again, like I said before, I, I you know, I think it, I think it was well received, and and I and for some reason I thought it wasn't, like you know, it just uh, yeah, it was it was a bit of a head scratcher though for for the for those folk music critics too. They're like, well, you know. Well, critically, it, it did well, well too. Yeah, right? because people said they turned around and said, "Hey, you know, this isn't the you know whatever, but it, we like it." Yeah, especially the British journalists. I mean, they they love Bob Dylan over there. Yeah, <laughs> they're 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 crazy about him. I've I've gone on YouTube. There's so many, uh, you know, uh, I guess they were journalists at one point. They might be retired, and they and they do they do they you know a lot of videos of uh, favorite albums and all oh, my top 10 favorite Bob Dylan albums. And they go into such depth about each one. And it's like, wow, you know, there's so much to cover and, you know, Nashville skyline. Yeah. was surprisingly on, on a couple of their lists, but, um, but yeah, the, the way they, they embrace how different he could be. Yeah. I think, yeah, they I didn't shy away from that. They, they didn't yeah. shy away from it at all. I think they, I think he probably even more so than the American critics, I think. So I don't know for sure, but I, I I suspect that, you know, I hear a a lot more positive things coming out of the British, British folks over there, but um, yeah, they just, they just love them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And if you, if you want to hear, if you want to hear clever, if you want to hear how clever Dylan can be within a a short song, 
is listen to Peggy Day on mm-hmm. this. It, it's very much a wordplay with with you know spending my nights with Peggy Day and then spending my days with Peggy Knight, and it's just a fun like you know he's just he just r- rattles this stuff off, and the way these songs sound because they're so short. Yeah, uh, and quick and to the point. It sounds like they were just recording like so much stuff. Would what just you, rolling what, this stuff off? What do you think this song sounds like to you? What Peggy does it Day. remind you? Yeah, what does it remind you of? Um, uh, so, nothing that comes to mind. Um, Beatles, maybe. Like what? Uh, George Harrison. Do 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 do. You know, like uh, ah, uh, you don't talk about yeah. Do, 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 do. You know, um, good lord! I want, to, I want, I want to tell, I want to tell you. Yeah, no, well, yeah that, that and uh, that the, I think that was the lick that you were just humming right there. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm wrong. And of course, you know, this would be not too far straying from the path of what he would do in the with the Wilburys, right? I mean, this yeah. is kind of in, in that, the same that sort yeah, of quirky, in the same realm. You know, Again, let me see two, two for four, you blue, six. for you, for you blue. blue. Okay, That's from from I'm let talking. it be. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. And, and and that that's that is a good comparison because Let It Be was like the rough kind of stuff that they were just throwing together too, right? And mm-hmm. and that kind of that kind of loose feel. That's like the loosest feeling Beatles album because it was all just the sessions. Yeah. And it seems like that's what this is is like they recorded the sessions and whatever came out mm-hmm. uh, they kind of went with. Because, yeah, two, going see, two with four six. Sort of- the 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 first side is less than 15 minutes. If if it's 12 minutes, <laughs> it's not a long album. But there's no. a lot there. Um and and side 2 opens with what is my favorite song and the highlight of this album and the most and it sounds like an outlier and and it's Lay Lady Lay open side 2. It actually to me does not sound like the rest of the album. It sounds much more produced and much more arranged. It mm-hmm. sounds like this was a proper song that they recorded everything else sounds like they just turned on, you know, they just turned on record and whatever came out. Yeah, I agree. It's much more atmospheric. You know, and I, yeah. I love you know. the guitar, yeah. the pedal steel on this, just that those, those like suspended notes that are just in the background. And, and he really does kind of push the vocalizations on this song. I think this is the song that was meant to be that kind of vocal. Yeah. Like, I think, I think everything, I, I have a feeling everything was built around this song, like everything else. Cause this is like the, feels like the fullest realization. When they say of, croon, of the song. crooner, I mean, he really goes, he really goes low. Yeah. You know, that lady. And it's, and it's very like in the mic, you know, very, just sort of, uh, just very warm and, and just that low end. It just, it gets, yeah, you, it's very you know, personal because like, you know, you're used to that, eh, eh, you know, like, but you know, he, the fact that he could go that timber is just, is, is, is crazy. Yeah, and that's yeah, I, the thing. He was he was really you know, kind of kind of challenging that, and 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 I think it paid off. It's I think it's one of his best. Uh, again, oh. my opinion, one of his best songs. It was written originally for Midnight Cowboy, but it, he missed the deadline. I can that. see that. I can t- I can um, totally see that being, you know, because it does it, it it has that feel, you know, almost like everybody's talking in in, in a way. It's not as fast. It's not as you know, but mm-hmm. um, but I could totally see that being the alternate choice or, or, or maybe the original choice, whatever, but you know, yeah. or just a- add it in there. And, and supposedly yeah. the, the legend goes that it was written about somebody in particular, pretty big actress at the time, big, pretty, pretty big actress and singer at the time that this was supposedly written about. Mm. Take a shot. You, you quizzed me. It's only right that I quiz you now. I throw a stumper your way. Ah. And I'm not, I'm not humming anything. An actress <laughs> singer. Ooh. Late sixties, and Margaret, Barbara Streisand. Really, supposedly this was written about Barbara Streisand. I wonder if she knows that. <laughs> well, I'm sure she does now. <laughs> I'm not breaking the news. It's not. This is not a news flash. <laughs> it's it's been out there a while. Just kind of like you're so vain, right? Is about uh, right? about Warren Beatty or whoever. Uh, oh, I think it's about ten different people. Yeah, a bunch I, of people. But yeah, it's always been, the, the urban legend was it's about Warren Beatty, and it made sense that it might be. So yeah, Lady Lady, Lady Lay is supposedly about Barbara Streisand. Um, so that that's a little interesting little tidbit there too. Wow. Um, side two also very light and breezy. Songs like One More Night, Country Pie. 
mm-hmm. a minute and 37 seconds. And the song literally cuts off like there was supposed to be more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like I, I was, right. I was listening to this album like a couple of times, you know, when we do it, I, I, I try and give at least three listens. Like I try to. Mm-hmm. So one is like a not paying attention. Listen, like I'll just put it on or whatever. And then I'll listen and country pie ends. And I'm like, wait, I said, is my record have a skip in it or something? Like, cause I was listening on vinyl. I was like, is that a skip? Cause it sounded like it just ended like, like literally no fade out. It's just like, and yeah. I, I was like, no, it, it literally, it, it, that's the rawness. Like that's the, the, you know, the kind of lo-fi recording that they're doing here is, is these things are just kind of like little thoughts, sh- you know, under three minutes, sometimes under two minutes, but it gets the point across and it's just really was just, it's, it's got a, the banjos. It's, it's got, it's got the guitars. It's ugh harmonicas everything I love I love the steel pedal on this Pete Drake yeah. you know he and, he and he played on a few uh some really popular popular records uh, he, he uh Stand by Your Man with Tammy Wynette he did uh Lynn Anderson's Rose Garden Charlie Rich's Behind Closed Doors which yeah, I love Yeah Charlie Rich love that song My I parents always love that, that song. song too Yeah yeah <laughs> So yeah so these the are these are, these are pros these are con- <laughs> these are certified country pros that he was surrounding yeah. himself with mm-hmm. So definitely you know in entrenching himself in this atmosphere and really again turning his back for for all intents and purposes on the whole the whole folk scene and just going his own way, you know, plugging in, going electric and, and getting a lot of people mystified there. Then really sequestering himself away after his motorcycle accident and disappearing mm-hmm. for a while. And then reemerging with, with like just said, John Wesley Harding, which was kind of setting the table and then Nashville skyline, which was just straight up, yeah. straight up country. And then he would release self portrait after, right after this in 1970, which was a lot of covers. Yeah. You know, so, so he really didn't, you know, this was really kind of like the, la- you know, the last gasp for him of the 60s. Um, and then going into the 70s would be just kind of uh, on his way to another reinvention, getting up to blood on blood on the tracks, mm-hmm. which I, I think I think it was of, kind of working up to that. That's one of that. That's a masterpiece, that record. Yeah. That's if, you know, all the ones that, you know, people talk about the one, the more popular. You know, that's probably my favorite of that. You know, when people talk about Blonde on Blonde or, or Highway 61, I mean, Blood on the Tracks, I think, is is probably the, the best of that bunch of like the top five, the top tier albums oh, that yeah. people always talk about, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, because so. in between he had a bunch, you know, in the 70s, there was a bunch of greatest hits albums and, and kind of, you know, he did the soundtrack for Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid and Planet yeah. Waves. Kind of getting, kind of getting there, and then when seventy five rolls around and he drops blood on the tracks, it was just like, okay, phase three, beginning, uh, beginning. <laughs> a lot of you know, you know, you know, you know, there were quite a few misfires for sure. Yeah, but I don't think if somebody like us or who who really don't know maybe Bob Dylan that well, at least they're interesting. It's interesting to just even even the stuff that's bad. Uh, or considered bad is is interesting enough to listen to and say, oh yeah, you know, it's it's cool that he did that. Yeah, you know, it's cool that he tried that, or it, you know, whatever. I mean, it's it's just yeah, you know, it's so eclectic. I mean, it's it's just so amazing somebody could just switch gears like that. You know, yeah, because he, like, he would release the basement tapes in the same year, so he yeah. comes out with with blood on the tracks, and then re reemerges with with all these tapes from what you're talking like seven years earlier then. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause now the band was, was, was something pretty big too by 75. So that kind of made sense. It's like, oh, these guys back then were the Hawks mm-hmm. kind of came up to, to upstate New York to kind of help me recover and just play some songs. And now it's like, oh, we've got this, these legendary sessions. Yeah. Let's put them out. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I think that begins phase three, which was, you know, he's, the- he's like his own MCU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, we're heading into the '80s, and it's just you know. I think that was probably his his low period. I think consistently. I don't think he. Uh, I think Oh Mercy might have been probably the best of. I mean, that's like '89, and we're talking. I mean, he did the Wilburys, and then, but again, like he embraced the the, the sort of the fun of it and and did something light and breezy with like with that but like yeah. oh mercy he would get with daniel and who was you know producer for u2 peter gabriel robert robertson even which was a, a a great a great comeback i guess but he wasn't really 
his albums in the eighties weren't as as strong. And I think they well, got yeah, a, lot just, of, a lot of yeah, heat. Starting off and, in, I mean, starting off know, in 1980 was saved, which was, uh, he had converted to Christianity. Yeah, so yeah. it was kind of, it was kind of like, you know, not like a straight up gospel album, but it was exploring those themes. So he started off the eighties with that. So yeah, you can kind of say, you know, and then, and then yeah, shot of love, which is kind of a, a strange one as well. And then he kind of starts recovering with with infidels and and some of that stuff. And then he and then he you got to remember too that his his partnering with Tom Petty in the eighties was very important because mm-hmm. he asked Tom Petty to go out with him and and be his backing band. Yeah, you know, so that that actual connection I think was really important too um, because they just toured 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 endlessly. Uh, and I think that was what. Uh, well, that was the, that was probably the big the, one of the highlights was the live you know that tour that relationship that was formed, this would probably be like Dylan at his most, how do you say it more, most alive, I guess you could say, I don't know. It's like a lack of a better term in his mo. You could see that he's really enjoying being into with, it in a band, like a big, yeah. a big band at that, the heartbreakers, you know, this was not, you know, just a, a four piece thing or whatever. I mean, this is like, the, you know, these are, this is an established band and he's having a lot of fun and he's just, it's just, you know, yeah. And uh, then, then that would lead to the Wilburys. Then all of a sudden, a strange set of circumstances occurs where George Harrison needs to record a B-side for some of his stuff from Cloud Nine. He needs he need he left his guitars. <laughs> Tom Petty gets involved, and then they need to record somewhere. So they contact, well, Bob Dylan's got a studio. So let's see if his studio is available at his house, and they go there, and then you know, Jeff Lynn was working with Roy Orbison at the time. And then you end up with five people in a room recording mm-hmm. a song that's supposed to be a B-side. And Warner Brothers says, you know, no, send send it back. Go ahead and, and give us a whole album of that. Mm-hmm. And and then Bob, so Bob Dylan did jo- actually join a group called the Traveling Wilburys. And I think that was him at his, I, you know, that this goes against, I think, everything that Dylan was about. And that's why when, I, when it came out, I was so like, what is Bob Dylan doing in this group? Because he is such a loner when it comes to that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And such an outsider. And and really kind of does his own thing, but then it kind of makes sense <laughs> that he that he's gonna do his own thing, and he and he would be the last guy you would expect to jo- to join the traveling Wilburys and kind of embrace that that kind of strange strange character. They all took on different personas, and there was this whole thing built up about it. And he was full on with it. And and the reason why you could tell is because they did a volume three. They did a second album after Roy Orbison passed, and he was. Mm-hmm. Actually, he he features heavily, I think, on Volume Three. Yeah, I think it's, it's and that's the, actually what turned me off a little bit in the beginning because I wasn't into him then. I remember that, you know, you're like, it's too much Dylan. Yeah, I'm like, too this much. guy's all over the place. I said it's like a Bob Dylan album. Well, think about it. Like they they were they but now were, I love it. Yeah, they were like praising Roy Orbison. They were kind of pushing him as like the, he was like the star of the Wilburys. Everybody was like singing or, when he died. Yeah, I think Dylan took over that you know that that spotlight that as a senior word. he had he had the you know uh yeah. orbison had the most seniority george, george harrison group, right he was very, yeah he was very happy to step back and say let let bob yeah and i think i i look upon this as the the bob dylan album that jeff lynn produced or never or never produced on his own like he went and produced yeah everyone else in the except in the band, for dylan except which is very dylan. interesting yeah, so this album for me is like that Bob Dylan album that never was that that yeah. Jeff Lynne produced. You know, yeah, if you yeah. call if you call everything from from Volume One and Volume Two, uh, you know, and 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 Dylan is having fun with those lyrics, Tweeter and the Monkey Man, yeah, and congratulations. So he, you know, he's kind of coming, you know, and then when you get to Volume Three, uh, it's just great. You could tell he's just having some great fun with it, and that that's one of the great things about about Dylan that it eventually I, th- I guess you learn about him is that he doesn't take himself too seriously. That's right. That other, I, everybody else does, and I think as the antidote to that, he doesn't for the most part. He's very he's very reclusive. Doesn't give a lot of interviews anymore. Yeah. But when he does, he just does things that that he wants to do. Right. I, it, it 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 surprised me. You know, going back to like it surprised me that he even agreed to to be with a band and, and, you know, just, but I think there's a, it, because it was so tongue and tongue and cheek. And so I think that's like, what it was. Yeah. Tickled like, his fancy. I think that's, yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're going to do this. And then you get to songs like new blue moon. I could yep. just, <laughs> or will Wilbury twist or she's my baby. I mean, these songs, the, the lyrics are ridiculous. <laughs> Right, but you when know? Dylan when Dylan comes in, you could just you know what I'm talking about yeah. too. When he's with the hand on the hip, 
<laughs> Come on, so you know, like, and, and then, <laughs> we'll get to yeah. that in a minute. But I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah, just, you know. it was just a great. You know, I I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I did grow to appreciate Bob yeah. Dylan, and that that will sure. lead us to the story. Is you know, over time, it's like, yeah, okay, I get it, and started being exposed to more things and, and opening up and and going back and listening. And then in 2017, <clears throat> Bob Dylan comes around and I'm hoping for like Nashville skyline stuff and all this other great stuff. So I call, I call Eric. Uh, I said, Hey, you know, I think we should see Dylan. Like, we don't know we, what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, we're, like we're, I think it's a, I think it's a bucket list, whether, you know, whatever it's going to be, what, you know, I think we need to go to a Dylan show. So he's like, yeah, all right. So what we had done is I had a three day sequence that week of concerts, three days in a row. So the first day it was like a Wednesday was Jack Johnson at Forest mm -hmm. Hill stadium. So Eric came up, you know, I, I got tickets for that. So Eric did uh, Jack Johnson, which was great. A great, it was a great week of shows because it was a great com you know, compilation of artists. And then the, the second night was Bob Dylan in, at the Capitol theater in Port Chester, New York. So Eric was for that. <laughs> Eric could not take a third show with me. He's like, I have to leave town. I need my family. I need to be away from you. I, I got so I went to Dawes the next night at, at the at the at the Capitol Theater as well. And uh, if I said Paramount before, I meant Capitol Theater in Port Chester. But so anyway, so we go to Jack Johnson, which was an absolutely amazing show. It was. It, that um, was just a go. Oh, Bahamas open. Such a oh, special oh, night. I mean, yeah, the, the was weather good. was beautiful. Jack Johnson was just on, on point and it was just a, a great show. So we, mm -hmm. we reconvened the next day. It's like, all right, we're going to see Dylan. Let's do it <laughs> in the Capitol theater, which is a small, smaller venue. So it's great. Uh, general admission, right? So GA yeah. is, is there's no seats. So you go in and you can, you know, you get to the yeah. front, you're in the front. Yeah. So the first indication that there was something amiss were the signs on the front doors of the venue when we get there saying absolutely no cell phones will be tolerated. There was those signs yep. everywhere. It was like, okay, all right, you know, whatever. Like no cell phones. Sure. So no, sure, no, no cell phones. Everybody's right. got a cell phone. Right. <laughs> so we, we go in and we got there early so we can kind of be up front for, for Dylan. Right. And people start like kind of whipping out their phones, just like taking a picture of like the stage beforehand. And they, these people got swarmed by, by people. There was people like in the upper balconies, like watching and looking down. Yeah. They, they had literally, they literally made people turn on their phone and delete the photos. Do you remember that? I do. I do. They had people like open your phone, go to the photos and delete them. And I'm like, holy crap. You've never seen anything like it. I mean, yeah, these guys I, like, they just, they just came out of nowhere. They were like, ninjas like they, yeah they would just yeah, like yeah. they would like swarm somebody and yeah. like open your open your phone right because we saw it on and so i'm like holy crap i'm not even i was afraid to go go pee yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that so that was kind of like the setup so i was like all right so, so we're in, yeah we're at one point we were standing in towards the front and uh my uh, i remember distinctly two guys talking about these obviously were seemingly uh, big fans of the guy yeah. of Dylan and they were like yeah I went I saw him back in you know whatever and you know the 70s and blah blah, blah. you know it's so Everyone many times telling of, their war stories of, of, of Bob Dylan right so yeah. <laughs> save we'll save it for the end we'll save it for the end yeah. we'll, but but yeah but, but, so that, so yeah a lot, a lot of people actually that when we were in, in that area a lot of people were doing that like oh I saw him in Philly and I saw him in Kingston and I saw yeah. like just like the dead right people kind of follow so every a lot of those people in the front were like the hardcore fans really kind of regaling us or, or we were just overhearing who saw, I saw him 35 times. I saw him 20. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, that, that's, that's kind of neat. You know, we're with some, some hardcore fans. Um, and what had happened in 2017 is, is Dylan was at the end of a three album cycle of standards. Yes. So he had started to do cover tunes of like the old forties, you know, forties and maybe early fifties standards. He had done one album, he had done a second album, and then his third album was called Triplicate, not because it was the third in the cycle, but it was because it was a triple album of yes. standards. These, yeah, these were not single record. <laughs> these were. They, they... <laughs> so he released his last one was a triple album of standards. So we, I, I, I kind of knew, I kind of was aware of it going into it. Then the show starts. Mm -hmm. You want to pick it up? <laughs> yeah. 
What were your so impressions? Here, what was so your here, impression? So here's the band starts playing. And all of a sudden you see this little scrawny, like just the silhouette of he's so small and so, so, so skinny, and fragile and, and fragile. And, you know, but not and he, frail. And he comes out and he just does just whatever the, whatever the F he wants. I mean, he just basically just, there were songs that you recognize, but he obviously didn't do them the same, quite the same way. A hell of a I lot was of, lost. I, I a hell of a lot of the. St- I mean, he was doing a lot of the standards, which pissed people off. Yes, to and, and most not I, like that at all. I, I looked up the set list. I was like, I, I just did it. I just did it before the show. I said, let me see what what these songs actually works. I still don't know a lot of them. It turns out most of them were from the album Tempest, which came out in 2012, and that was his last studio album before he started doing all the standards of original material. Um, what yeah. what Eric left out is when Dylan came on stage, he did not greet the audience. He did no. not say good evening. He did not say hello. He just came out and started and started sit, started the show. Yeah. Right? Which, uh, you know, other or I've seen other artists that do that. But usually they, they'll do a song or two and then they'll say, but, hey, but good they'll, evening. But they'll welcome, say, hey, hey, you doing? You know, how you doing? Uh, you know, yeah. But he... We, <laughs> we didn't get two words out of not him. The, and, and not the whole, the whole time he that did. That wasn't a lyric. And... Even when he did, like he was almost, you know, he's doing all these standards, right? And it's almost like he's mocking the songs because he's he's got his, you know, he's doing this weird sort of dance, like he's got his hand on his hip and he's like moving back and forth, and he's like almost making fun of what he's what he's performing, of what he's singing, in a way. Like it's like it's so, and that he would and, walk and, to the back of the stage and, and it, sing and you couldn't really see him. Right. He, he, then was, he would come up and it was like three different microphones and he didn't know which one he was going to stand in front. It was, and, it was, it was, it was bizarre. very strange. Right. And Especially he, coming off of like something that was so building togetherness, like Jack Johnson was the night before. Right. Cause we had had such a, a, a cooperative experience or whatever with the crowd and with Jack, with Jack. And it was just like, you felt a part of that. You felt a part of the show. And in this show, yeah, the you oddest, felt, you felt that you felt the distance. And I think the, the the biggest thing that threw people off, um, the oddest thing was that he did not play guitar on any song. Yeah, he played piano a couple times. He played piano. He would, like an upright piano, he'd walk up to it and just sort of bang on the piano and just do the song like a different, in a different key arrangement or whatever. Yeah, most of them sounded like the the, the standard or standards arrangements that he was doing with the other songs. Yeah. So it was almost indecipherable to me. Yeah. It was kind of more of a casual, a very casual listener. I'm like, I don't recognize any of these, Which, but then it turns out most of it was from Tempest that I didn't I, know anyway. But, but see, that's the thing. I like that though. I like the fact that he, you know, was doing, it, it had a much more cohesive overall sound in the show itself. Yeah. I like that he was doing something different. I, 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 I dug that. I, I but I, <laughs> I thought it was absolutely hilarious though, that at the end of the thing, you know, I, how, enraged people were and this just like took me back when you know all the horror stories you hear about the people like back at the newport festival yeah and then this and he's still keep it, keep pissing, it clean keep it clean if you can he's still <laughs> we, he's, we had some people that were he's still pissing people off he's i, I mean people were what we were walking out and those, those 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 two guys that we that were standing in front of us were cursing him out. They said F, "F Dylan, F F Dylan, mother F," and, and they, they were, were so and pissed. They were yelling at the stage, like they turn around and they would give him the stage the bird, and it's just. I was laughing the whole time because I'm like, you know what? You guys are supposed to be Bob Dylan fans. You would, you should come to expect this. Yeah, if you're I, a I true, think- if you're a true Bob Dylan fan, that you you should know that this would not be. This is not unheard of. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like it's 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 like so you you can't be that. I, I suppose you, I you mean, shouldn't yeah, be surprised. I, you shouldn't be surprised. We okay, were. I, I get that it might be a bad <laughs> show, but for you to get so like upset like that, I mean, that was just yeah. You know, we we walked out of there scratching our heads, and, and I yeah. think it wasn't until I, a couple I, of I days loved, later. I, I thought it was great. I thought I was laughing because, you know, if I'm going to experience a Bob Dylan show, that, and that's what it was. Might that, as, that, this might as well be it because that, you know that, I mean? that, like, and that was the thing is, <laughs> is that Dylan was only going to ever give us what he wanted to from him. So, that's right. and he literally did not say good night. He did not, you know, come out and say, thanks for coming. He literally put on a performance on his terms. And that's what, <laughs> and that, and that show kind of epitomizes 
what we're talking about with Nashville Skyline is that is that this is a man who makes decisions not based on what he thinks the crowd wants to hear, mm-hmm. how they want to hear it, or what it is, but he's going to do whatever tickles his fancy, whatever whatever yeah. mood he's in. And if he's not in a talking mood, no offense, you know, like like yeah. that. That's what it was. So so the show was an interesting parallel to to Nashville skyline about how he was bewildering people with what he was doing and changing his voice. And he bewildered us at the show by doing songs that we could not recognize because of the way the, they were arranged because he was yeah. doing mostly standards mm-hmm. and yeah, people were, were salty walking out of that place. They, I, I, and I guess the people that came expecting to hear, you know, blowing in the wind with the guitar and, and the harmonica yeah. and yeah. hearing tangled up in blue. And they didn't get any of that. He did not give any no. of that. No. He did not. He did, he did not give, you know, you, and usually at that age, you're on the greatest hits tour. You know, you're, you're just doing everything that everybody wants to hear it. And I got to hand it to him. That's a testament that, to him. That yeah. He, yeah. That he's like, I don't care. Right. Like you're, you, if you're going to get it, if you are going to get it at all, you're going to get it the way I want to deliver it. Mm-hmm. And you may not get it at all anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and we didn't. And we walked out of there. We were kind of puzzled. We were puzzled, but it was. A, <laughs> and we it were was laughing a great, about it. Yeah, it, it was, was kind of like great, it, I thought. I I look upon it as a as a great experience. It, like was a, it was. It was. It was. It was definitely like I looked at it as almost like a piece of art. Like that. That yeah. show was him delivering exactly. an artistic statement of 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 what he was doing because he was dressed in you know he had like black black like tuxedo trousers had a pinstripe down the side and he wore like this double breasted <laughs> jacket and yeah. the studio looked like an old recording set studio. I mean, it was yeah. really like, like he was, he was putting something across. And I think that might've been part of it is what I'm doing is not for me to interact with the audience, but to present this. Present you know, and, and the fact yeah. that, that anybody that turned on a camera got swarmed. So you, you really almost can't go on YouTube. There's some, some lucky people that got some footage from that tour, but mm-hmm. they, they, you know, it was almost like, you're going to see this and no one else is going to, mm-hmm. which I thought was, you know, that it was a little heavy handed the way that they were handling it. But, um, I, I got the intent. A lot of artists are like that nowadays. They're like, Hey, do us a favor after this song, you know, put, put your cameras away do it up to this song and then put it away. Yeah. So I, I can understand that where he's maybe just like, yeah, just, you know, yeah, you're not going to get that here. He may want to, if he decided to take what, what was recorded and, and put it out there. I mean, there are artists that are still wanting to do that and make, you know, there, there are documents of certain tours of certain concerts that they thought were amazing that, you know, and when you have people out there, you know, recording the whole show on their phone and putting it on YouTube. What's the point, right? And yeah. it's just, you just can't. You know, nowadays you just it, the live album is 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 almost dead. I mean, yeah, it's gone because you could go on YouTube the next day, and right? See you the don't show. see it. Yeah, you don't see it. You know, absolutely. So cool. My, you know, but my my experience though with Dylan, uh, honestly, was uh, I just want to say a few words about Time Out of Mind and just how important that record was to me. <clears throat> um, back in '97, you know. Uh, that was I was going through a kind of a rough patch and that ca- album just kind of fell into my lap. And that was a very important record to me. So, it, it, you know, Nashville Skyland is your favorite Dylan album. Time out of mine is mine. So, and, and maybe eventually I'd like, I wouldn't mind doing talking about that one as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's down the road, but uh, you know, but anyway, that that was a really real important album. And I, I really, I, to this day, I still, love the, the the production on it and we you know when you do stuff like lord huron we're into that kind of atmospheric thing this album has it it has that sort of feel mm-hmm. i feel like almost feel like this it, it, it might have started there you know all these other bands were doing that kind of like echoey mm-hmm. kind of old old timey kind of like very dreamy like yeah the, with the know, reverb and and that's what when we did lord <laughs> huron that's what really struck me about that it reminded me of time out of mind in mm-hmm. that sense of, of of, of going back to an older time and, and yeah. just, you know, it's just, yeah, it, I, I love that. I love that feel, love the atmosphere. And again, it's, a, it's an album, not about politics. It's about mortality. It's about, you know, relationships late in life, that kind of thing and breaking yeah. up. And, you yeah, know, I, I, I so, think the fact that he was able to yeah. rip himself away from those, those labels that were put on him allowed him yeah. to, to actually ha- continue to have a career. Where That's he right. would could do whatever he want, continue to to evolve, and and continue to have a career through the '90s, and just put out stuff that uh, on his own terms, and and some of it was hits, some of it was misses, and some of them were were really big hits. 
Uh, absolutely amazing, Bob Dylan. You know, Nashville Skyline. It, it's a it's a short it's a short album. So go ahead. You know what? Take twenty five minutes out of your life because I don't even think it'll take that long. And, and take a trip with with Nashville Skyline. I, I think you're going to enjoy it, even if you say I hate Bob Dylan. Uh, I was one of the big skeptics myself, and and Nashville Skyline just captured my heart because it's so quick. The ditties are just so catchy. And and like you said, breezy and and keeps moving and everything's really up tempo and really nice and and it is a, a a transitional period in in this artist who has has had so many transitional periods. I mean, just lay Lady Lay alone. Just listening to that song that does it for me that kills me. That song, I love it. Yeah, sure. I can't imagine anybody not liking that tune. But I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I just you know, wish, I was hoping. You know. I, I think I may have said to you. I said I don't care if he what else what he does. I think I may have said I, I just hope he does lay Lady Lay. And walked out with a big handful of disappointment <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of guys cursing behind us. F this guy, F D- Dylan. They hated him, but we love him. We love Bob yeah. Dylan. He's a, he's a traveling. He's, he's, also- he's definitely a, you know, he's a force to be, I mean, you can't yeah. help, but you know, you, you, I don't get caught up. I don't tend to get caught up in the mystique. And we talked about this with Morrison and you know, how these, how, you know, but I don't know. He's just, enigmatic, Dylan. He's though. Just he is very enigmatic. From, uh, he, he he's he's a yeah. He's he, something else. He definitely is. He's and something I, and else. I guess the only other artist that I could probably compare him to w- again would be Bowie, and I've really started to come to appreciate him mm-hmm. now that he, you know now that he's gone. But yeah. uh, you know, but again, yeah, it's just these these artists are sometimes are and that's what they are. They're true artists in a Auteur, very very yeah, that's right <laughs> they're in a, they're so, on a whole nother level yeah <laughs> so absolutely yeah. and he and and yeah. dylan's in the pantheon of 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 rock and roll of music mm-hmm. poetry all that so uh I, i'm glad that i was able to get in the nashville skyline i'm glad we were able to share it with you in this episode and that's going to do it for this episode of the 3324 podcast you can find us on social media instagram and facebook we're at 3324 podcast twitter we're on 3324P, so we actually make little tweets, too, uh, every so often. So check us out there. Uh, we do live shows uh, every other week uh, on Wednesdays on Facebook, so check us out there as well. We're, we're, we, we're very vibrant. We keep ourselves busy. Yeah. Uh, but, but go ahead and visit a live show and meet us and, and have a good time. It's very interactive. Uh, we do some giveaways every so often. It's a lot of fun. So until next time, for Eric, this has been Dean. We will catch you on the flip side. You've been listening to the 3324 Podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 